the dictionary tells us that a toy is a tool for play. It can also be a trinket or something connected with a sport or a pastime. So toys and play are a means to have fun and it follows that it isn't something that is solely the domain of children. In this programme we're going to take for our theme the design of the objects we call toys. Why they're designed the way they are and what this can tell us about design in general. And we'll deal again with issues we've considered more fully in other programmes function, materials, manufacture and how we use things but we'll be concentrating on two important clues to the understanding of appropriate design. The first is the fact that many products exist because we need something else. Like the electric drill, we need a drill because we need holes. Similarly, we need toys because we need to play. The second is concerned with the design of a product matching our expectations and for the design of a toy this is not as simple as it may first appear. So to understand what makes a well-designed toy we'll have to consider a wide range of influences, some of which are psychological in nature, ranging from role play to fantasy play, from pastimes to hobbies, from things we care for to things we don't. In fact, from children's toys to adult toys. We'll take things chronologically, seeing how design matches our changing expectations as we grow. And the best place to begin is with the toys we give to the very young infant. A young baby has innate desires for food and survival, together with a keen sense of curiosity. Of course, many of the mental and physical abilities are at a very low level of development at first. So that toys for this age of child tend to be extremely simple, like these. Simple shapes and brightly coloured. Let's first consider colour perception and its development. The development of our eyes and how the brain interprets what we see continues at a rapid rate during the first year of our lives. Once a baby is able to focus its images, then colour differentiation is made on wide bands of the visual spectrum where there is clear contrast. Consequently, yellow and red are perceived first, followed by blue and green. Most experts feel that bright versions of these colours are essential to stimulate the child's development. On the other hand, some people prefer pastel versions, although no one as yet has managed to obtain the baby's opinions. As for the form of these early toys, well, shapes tend to be simple. Such toys will have rounded edges so that small fingers and mouths won't get damaged. Coloured plastic is an appropriate choice as a material, since it won't chip or splinter when chewed or sucked. At the same time, babies are also given soft furry toys, usually with a simplified animal form, which may go on to become a permanent companion and for security. So for these first playthings for infants, we can sense that appropriate design is concerned with perception, dexterity, safety and security. So, although clues are important when judging the appropriateness of design, they're also the means by which we make sense of the world around us. And it's at this very young age that these clues are first learnt, to help the baby make sense of what he or she sees. For example, when a baby looks along a hallway, it looks at first as if the walls and the floor and the ceiling all taper to a point or if someone puts their head into a baby's cot, it suddenly becomes huge. Coochie coochie. Of course, the baby soon learns that the head's not grown bigger, but that the person has come nearer. And the corridor does not taper to a point, but the end of the hallway is simply further away. There have been many studies concerned with how we visually perceive, including one that shows how our eyes focus on key features only, such as the eyes and mouth of a person's face, and merely scan the overall shape of the head storing these critical clues for future use. So with toys for the young child, simplified shapes are best. All too soon, the young child is up and mobile and able to respond to the stimulus of sound, together with increased dexterity and visual perception. Soon the baby is interacting with others in play and the challenge to the designer of toys becomes more complex. While these children are playing with their toys and one another, they are also learning a great deal about themselves, about their bodies, social customs, and the world they will grow up in. That's what play is for, and they're having fun doing it. 
Even in this small space, it is easy to see many of the ways children play and the toys that are essential to them. By this age, they often play by taking on roles. Thank you, Mommy. I need the Mommy. Yeah, just share. Imitating the preparation of a meal or buying things in a store using simplified versions of real-world objects. They run, climb, and stretch their bodies to test their physical potentials on play structures. Sometimes they play quietly on their own, often just thinking or lost in their imagination. Or they play in pairs with a teeter-totter, challenging one another or working as a team. And all the time, they are learning finding out about balance and feet and hands and what they are capable of and what they are not, and then stretching themselves to try to do it anyway. Learning by copying and imitating. But let's first look more closely at the play structure and see what children do learn when playing on and in such a large outdoor toy. An integrated structure like this is a common sight not just here in this schoolyard, but in almost any park in Canada. Over the past 20 years, standards have been developed to deal with concerns for safety, yet still leaving lots of potential for adventure and physical play. Sliding, balancing, swinging, climbing, all at the right scale. For instance, these steps, simply by their height, can prohibit access to children who may be too small to climb up them. For those who are big enough, demanding physical challenges can be tackled repeatedly until they are conquered. Successful children can be imitated or competed with safely and interactively. The overall image of some other structures is interesting too. They can even look like an animal and become a place where children like to play. Or a house without the overall shape limiting the play. Of course, this isn't a real store, but for the designer, the question of how closely it resembles a real store is significant. And thank you for shopping at Mr. Yeti. Have a good day. Goodbye. An example from my youth will help to explain what I mean. <laughs> beep, beep. <laughs> well, long ago, I first learnt to drive in a cardboard box. I also learnt to fly in the same cardboard box. Meow. <laughs> and managed to command my box when it was a submarine. Full speed ahead, Captain. Full speed ahead. Later, I first practised as an architect with blocks of wood, just like these. And I also learnt a lot about demolition. What I'm getting at is that creativity for the child doesn't have to depend on a very complicated toy. Such a toy may, in fact, limit creativity because it offers a limited range of options, or worse still, it does what the child would want to do for itself. Recently, a friend of mine was shown one of these robot transformer toys by a small boy. The boy showed him how it changed from a robot into a truck. And then back again into a robot. Legs first, out with the feet. Oops. Out with the arms. Round there. And last not least. After one or two of these transformations, my friend grew as bored as the child had become. So they went to a nearby tree where they saved the planet by capturing an entire alien life force in a fortress made out of twigs and leaves with a little help from the Transformer and a lot from their imaginations. So, in a way, the boy was a victim of poor design. You see, unlike many items we buy for our own use when we're adults, most children's toys are just part of a phase of growing up, something that will be suitable at one particular time, only to be discarded sometime in the future. The child, unfortunately, has no prior knowledge of this, no experience to fall back on. They're not in a position to make such value judgments when choosing a toy to play with. 
Of course, a child might want a toy because a friend has one. Or perhaps they were seduced by some contrived TV ad uh, where simple toys appear to do amazing tricks time after time, uh, perfectly each time. Or the toy might be designed to appeal to the parent whose values may well differ from those of the child. The design challenge, then, is to produce a toy that might appeal to parents and children alike without the danger of being so creatively designed that there's little opportunity left for the child to be creative. One of the best examples of creativity can be found in fireworks. From a carefully chosen array of chemicals mixed and packed in a cardboard tube, we obtain a device that, when lit, will produce instant light sculptures in the sky, almost magically. And then they are gone. But they illustrate one of the greatest challenges to design, the creation of something very special out of something extremely simple something that will trigger our imagination to transform a simple event into another experience altogether, like these fireworks. Or at Christmas, the Christmas tree with its lights and decorations. In other words, to design something that will give full reign to a child's imagination. So in this context, appropriate design does not have to be complicated or clever. When I was a child, I also played with clothes pegs like these and a saucepan. Not ideal, perhaps. I could have chewed the wood, swallowed a spring, or nipped my fingers. Uh, but I learned to survive intact. These were real objects that don't really look like toys. At one level, they're just bits of metal and wood, just as my submarine was just a cardboard box. But in both cases, the perceived added value by the user, the child, is enormous. For instance, this set of building blocks is probably familiar to most of us. With only a few basic shapes, cubes, cylinders, rectangular slabs and a few triangular pieces, we can create fabulous castles and forts or farms or just about anything. So designers of toys, or anything else for that matter, are attempting to add value to basic raw materials, so that the end product would offer something more than just function, something to stimulate the imagination, to create apparent magic, or at least some special appeal. Of course, the danger in creating this magical something extra is the risk of losing sight of the main functional purpose of the toys or product. So, it isn't easy. Now, a successful toy will match the abilities of the child with its appropriate play potential. Jigsaw puzzles begin simply with large pieces, each containing a complete image. An animal or a house, sometimes with pigs to aid dexterity. And eventually, the child can enjoy puzzles with identically shaped pieces, where the image is fragmented and more subtle and logical clues must be found. Magic is in creating a picture from these little coloured pieces, whose individual shape disappears as the final picture is revealed. A similar progression can be seen in toys shaped like animals. The first toys are very simplified forms that slowly become more realistic, and finally, the child may even get the real thing. Board games too start simply, like Parcheesi or Ludo and Tiddlywinks and gradually become more complex with clever rules and intricate interrelationships, like Risk. The most successful board games are clever, entertaining and stimulate a healthy competition. And it's not easy to invent new ones, because most of the great games were invented long ago, like Checkers, Chess and Backgammon and, and Monopoly. In fact, the most successful toys have been around in one form or another for many years. For instance, when I was a child, I used to play with a kit of what were called mini-bricks. They were made of rubber, which made them safe to play with, but after a while, the rubber became brittle, cracked and fell to bits. Today's equivalent is Lego. So, improvements in materials and manufacturing techniques mean that nowadays toys can be made of plastic instead of rubber, or instead of painted wood, where the paint could chip off. And we've become so clever now that wind-up motors have been replaced by tiny, battery-driven electric ones. And we now even find electronics in places we never thought possible. Come dream with me tonight. This 
cleverness also means that we can create a toy that can imitate the real thing in amazing detail. Like this play food. Or this nursery doll, which not only walks, but drinks and wets. They look so real, but they're not. They offer false clues, in other words. Now, this isn't necessarily wrong or dangerous, but, well, is it a good thing or not? This travelling iron is part of a similar problem. It may look like a toy, but it's a fully functioning iron. This is the toy. Now, although this is a very convenient product, the fact that it looks like a toy means it may well be treated like a toy, or worse, regarded as having little value or reliability, and perhaps therefore not even bought. More seriously, this iron is a case of a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, because it looks toy-like, there's an inherent danger to the safety of children who may think it is a toy and consequently burn themselves. The toys of the adolescent may well be generally focused these days on personal stereos or skateboards, but play for the adolescent is far more complex. For example, some vandalism, particularly by adolescents, has been directly related to play. Climbing on a play structure is replaced by, say, swinging on a street sign. The world becomes a giant playground, and for some, the growing and learning of clues is still going on, and this leads from play to something far more significant. It can lead to situations where products are not treated the way the designer would have expected. They are not respected. Take a look at these scenes. At one time or another, We've all slammed a door in frustration, banged down the phone because of an upsetting phone call, nudged the vending machine a little when it swallowed our coins without dispensing its contents, rattled a door when we couldn't find out how to open it. So we've taken out our frustration on the products and in a sense, we have unwittingly vandalized them. Designers have to be aware of such possible misuse and design products to withstand rough handling, particularly if they are available in public places. Of course, vandalism in its extreme form is generally the result of some direct intent to damage. Spray-painted walls, broken windows. Much of what is vandalised deliberately is due to alienation. Some object or some new landscaping is seen as a threat to someone's territory. The best solutions to the problem lie not in building things to withstand an all-out attack, but merely to encourage respect, to not be perceived as a threat. After all, many natural objects, like trees, exist in the toughest neighbourhoods and survive unthreatened. In many ways, respect for property involves feeling a part of society, yet retaining our individuality too. That's why we personalise our desks or the most functional workstation with pictures, photographs and cartoons. So designers must help us develop a respect for the products that surround us. However, too much preoccupation with products themselves can lead to another extreme, materialism. Now, the dictionary defines materialism as a tendency to prefer material possessions and physical comfort to spiritual values devoid of any special appeal. That's a bit like cherishing a sophisticated electric drill and not using it. Or wanting a toy and then after a short time, not wanting to play with it anymore. So appropriate design should achieve some sort of balance. In other words, produce a well-designed product that's a pleasure to use and achieves the desired result accurately, efficiently and economically. And that's not always the case with adult toys. Adults play to relieve stress, to relax, or just escape from reality for a while. So toys for the adult vary a great deal, and often demand great dedication and care. Like the enthusiast who maintains an antique car, painstakingly working on it for hours on end. The stamp or coin collector would certainly argue that their collection is far from being a trivial toy, and the enjoyment and knowledge acquired are unquestionable. The same is true for those who play board games or cards. Indeed, most sports start out as mere games. And there is an additional reason for acquiring many adult toys. The camera has been described as a form of adult jewellery. And sports cars as boosts to our ego. Not hard to believe when the media and advertising show such great concern with image. 
So we see cars that look very fast with all kinds of non-essential accessories. And in our homes, we have banks of stereo equipment with controls, not unlike the cockpit of a 747. Well, there's nothing wrong with this, of course, so long as we can understand them. Here's another popular adult toy, the designer phone. Golf balls. Now, it could be argued that nothing is ever totally new. Usually it's a development or adaptation of something that already existed. Fortunately, that gives the designer and the public a lot of useful information to work with. So we can borrow clues on how to use or control something new from what came before it. But we also need clues that will satisfy us that this new design will be equally reliable. So to illuminate further the implications of this dilemma, let's look at the evolution of the telephone. The first telephones were made from brass and mahogany and some early plastics, with the technical parts enclosed here or in the wall. Soon after, along with the development of plastics, the universal black phone was created. Economical in manufacture and business-like in looks, the black phone was the norm for almost 50 years. And slowly, it became part of our everyday lives. We learnt to trust it. Once accepted, trusted, and with a fast developing market, the telephone adopted neutral colours, beiges and whites. Soon after came telephones in muted colour versions, a phone for every room, you might say. The forms became softer and a little less business-like, often bending to fashion, and now even shaped like Lego or Garfield. <laughs> Apparently toys, but with the seriousness associated with the familiar telephone handset and an evolved trust. More recently, telephones have become more intelligent, cleverer, with microchips and mini computers inside, able to talk and network with all sorts of other devices. The trouble is, most of us don't know how to use the blooming things. For example, try putting a caller on hold nowadays. There may be no visible relationship between what you have to press and the results you get. No feedback, in other words. With this system, you must depress the hook switch for a second, wait for a distinctive ringing, and then press the star and nine buttons. But how do you know the party is, in fact, on hold? With the old system, a flashing light indicated the caller was, in fact, on hold. And we, the users, actually make matters worse by blaming ourselves for not being able to understand the system, whereas it is the system itself that is not understandable, not logical. The accompanying manual doesn't help at all, because the relationships between what the telephone user wants to do and what they have to do and the results they get are totally arbitrary. Instead of removing the complexity, it is added. Today, we are faced with a great number of similar leading-edge electronic and computer-controlled devices, often using the colour black to make such products appear more high-tech than they really are. Just a bit of a fashion statement. Much of this new technology still needs to be assimilated and accepted to become more familiar and trustworthy. This is important for any product, even a toy. So let's review, then. The most appropriate design for a toy would ensure that it was safe, the right size for the child, made of the appropriate materials, match the child's expectations and stimulate creativity, learning and fun. And of course, the same can be said for any designed product. And this brings us to the most important clue in assessing the appropriateness of a design. More important than the product itself is the purpose for which it's been designed. For instance, a hi-fi might be easy to use and a great reproducer of sound. But it's also the music that is important. A car may be great to drive, but it's also to get us from A to B. Taking pictures and processing them may be enjoyable, but often the memories the pictures evoke can be far more valuable to us. And even more important than the house itself is the home it enables us to be part of. As we said at the beginning of the series, design is not a product, it's a process. Good design offers us the opportunity to make a significant link between ourselves and the world we live in. As a child, to learn the lessons that tell us about life and not forget them. And as adults, to enjoy life to its fullest. 
That's what appropriate design is all about.